Welcome back, beloved. Today's video is going to be a little bit different. It's titled, How God Saved Me From Pornography Addiction. Now, if you follow my channel, you know I, I don't like to make videos about myself. I made one testimony video about two and a half years ago. And now this is sort of a follow up to the testimony video. If you'll go to my channel, I'll also link it in the notes, you can watch my full testimony. And certainly pornography addiction was a large part of my testimony, but I don't wanna review my entire testimony today. Uh, the, the reason, the inspiration behind this video is that God, uh, he absolutely has healed me and, and uh, blessed me and saved me from this sin. And I'm so thankful for what he's done in my life, but I know there are Christians that struggle with this. And in God's providence, some of them have reached out to me over the years because I'm very uh, open about my previous pornography addiction. And I know that there are genuine believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, that this is still a snare to them. And it's an absolute honor to um, counsel them, to disciple them, to talk with them. I, I can't believe the Lord Jesus Christ allows me to do that. And I'm hoping this video will be an encouragement to many uh, who struggle with this and help them along their process with sanctification or somebody who is not born again will see my experience. We're going to go over many Bible verses and they will call upon the Lord to be saved. That really is the goal of this video. Now I'm going to break down this video. It's not meant to be too long into three parts. Number one, you need an overview of how I got saved or the video won't make much sense. Uh, I'm not going to do a full testimony again, but you need an overview of how I got saved because pornography addiction played such a massive role uh, in the sins that I was struggling with and in how I got saved. Number two, I want to explain my pre-salvation experience. By the grace of God, I was very conscious and I have a very good memory of some specific verses in the Bible, very specific verses as I was coming to faith and after faith that, that greatly helped me. I also had a post-salvation experience with lust and a temptation that the Lord was very gracious and led me through. And I believe he led me through that experience so I, could, so I can impart those verses and that wisdom to you guys today day. Um, so let's jump in with a quick overview of how I got saved, okay? So just to give you my background, I'm about 31 right now. The timeline's a little bit fuzzy, but from childhood to about 25, maybe 26, I was lukewarm. I thought I was a Christian my whole life. I, I went to church. I typically went to lukewarm churches, and I was immoral. From the earliest ages I can remember, I've been watching pornography. It was something I, I grew up with. When I got a computer, it got worse. When I got a smartphone, it even got uh, even worse, right? Then, uh, we'll talk about this more in a minute, I broke down, you know, you can call it early life crisis, you can call it whatever you want, right? I, I call it sin. It totally destroyed my mind. I was, I was you know, uh, suicidal. And so I began to seek the Lord. And I spent about six to nine months, once again, the timeline's a bit fuzzy, in legalism. Because when you don't have the Holy Spirit, you've basically got two options. You can sin to drown out your conscience and enjoy life, or you can legalistically pursue God in your own power. Those are your only two options. You're dead in your sins. So I tried that for six to nine months. Then by the grace of God, I was saved around 26 or 27, about four or five years ago. And now I'm still continuing to this day to be sanctified, right? And we're growing into that image of Christ. And we're going to talk about all of that today. So this is just an overview of how I got saved. Now, when I talk to people about this problem, the first question most people ask is, how bad was my addiction? Give me the dirt. Give me the drama. How bad was this? And listen, I try and walk a fine line. Ephesians 5.11 says, do not participate in the unfruitful deeds of darkness. Instead, even expose them. So we must talk about evil. We must confess our sin. We must be open about these things. But then it says it is disgraceful even to speak of the things which are done by them in secret. So I, I want to share that I was addicted. I did not just struggle with this. There were times I consumed this content for hours a day. Uh, the best words I can use to describe it would be pathetic and possibly demonic. I'm, I, I really... 
I really felt uh, specifically before I got saved as if I was overcome with an unclean spirit. I mean, I, w- I was just totally given over to this sin. And I, I usually tell people if they want a good example, if you know anything about video editing, you know it takes hours in front of a computer screen, especially if you're a little OCD like me, you want to get everything perfect. And I always tell people my computer never changed. Uh, you know, my smartphone never changed change. I spend just as much time on digital electronics now, but what I'm doing is vastly different, right? Because my heart has changed. So I was addicted. I mean, it was a horrible, malignant addiction and I'll leave it there. I don't want to talk about the gritty, gross details that can lead others to sin. And I just don't think it honors God, but that's where I was for specifically the, the early twenties of my life. I was working a lot. I was drinking a little bit. I was over consuming food. I was greedy with money to the core Wolf of wall street banking career. Not, not that much money, but you know, I was just greedy and lustful and just totally given over to sin. And so once again, this is just an overview. We're moving quickly. I landed myself in uh, just overnight, but I wasn't allowed to leave, which freaked me out. I landed myself in a psychiatric hospital. Uh, I self-admitted my wife and my my father wanted me to admit myself because I was uh, just very tempted to commit suicide. I was having suicidal thoughts. I didn't like plan it out or buy a gun or anything like that. Uh, But Romans chapter six really describes where I was at. It says, what benefit were you then deriving from the things of which you're now ashamed? The outcome of those things is death. I had fallen so headlong into sin. Nothing was joyful for me anymore. I was absolutely miserable. I was anxious. When I wasn't watching pornography, I was thinking about pornography. It was what made me happy, but it wasn't making me happy anymore. I was so stressed about life. I could feel the wrath of God. I knew I was going to die and go to hell. I felt life was worthless. And so like everyone else, that sin led to death. I mean, Galatians 6, the one who sows to his flesh will from the flesh reap corruption. I was a putrid, stinking mess. But this night in, it was Vanderbilt, psychiatric uh, emergency room. I wasn't allowed to leave. They're they're allowed to lock you up for a few weeks. So just like knowing that kind of freaked me out. I got out the next day, but it was kind of like a prodigal son moment. This was when I went from just living in sin to pursuing, legalistically pursuing God for a few months. But, you know, in the prodigal son parable, we hear, you know, he's living in sin, he's living in filth when he came to his senses. And so it was that night. I didn't get saved for six to nine months later, but it was that night in that uh, psychiatric emergency room that I knew I needed to turn my focus and my addictions, my desires towards God. I couldn't quite understand what I was thinking or saying, but I felt in my heart, if you can put that, it's not theologically accurate. I felt in my heart, which you can never trust feelings. uh, The Lord was saying, I know you're an addict. I know you're really messed up. I need you to be addicted to me. I need you to turn those desires towards me. And so I, you know, I quit my job. I, I, uh, you know, I, I started reading the Bible. I read books about the Bible. I got in other religions without even knowing it. Now I want to talk to you specifically related to sexual immorality about my pre-salvation experience. I, I basically took like months off work and I read the whole Bible and I tried to clean up my life. I got into running and exercise and eating right and lost 30 pounds. All these outward shows of religion to, that I had sort of washed myself, but in reality, I was dead inside. So I brought up a picture of the picnic table because I quit my job and there's a beautiful table down the street from me. Uh, I, I still use it to this day at a nice park and I'll go there and read my Bible. And that's what I was doing. And so for like months, I literally just went here and I read the whole Bible. I read books about the Bible and somewhere along this process, I I was not saved because I know the exact moment I got saved somewhere along this process, the Holy Spirit began to convict me and I could really see how unclean I was. In fact, I would look up to God and just, I was speaking very real to him. I would say, Lord, I know I don't enjoy you. The, the, the word says I'm supposed to enjoy you. I, I don't get any joy from you. I was reading the Bible like a legalist, seven chapters a day, get it done. And that's all I could do. I didn't have any desire for the Lord. And so I would look up to him and just say, Lord, I'm so sorry. Uh, I don't enjoy you, but I enjoy pornography. And I know you're supposed to be more enjoyable than pornography, but 
I don't know how to enjoy you. I, I, I was coming to the realization that I couldn't change myself. I was dead. And several verses played a key role. Matthew chapter 8 specifically, a leper looks at Jesus and says, Lord, if you're willing, you can make me clean. And I would just cry this out to Jesus like a leper for months. Jesus did not clean me. I didn't get saved right away. By God's grace, he led me through this process. And I hope this process might help you today. I would just look up to heaven and be like, Lord, God, Jesus, Holy Spirit, anybody, if you're willing, you can make me clean. I knew I was unclean. And Jesus said, no one can come to him unless the father who sent me draws him. The Holy Spirit was beginning to draw me to God. And this process took months. John chapter 16, Jesus speaking of the Holy Spirit says, when he comes, he convicts the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. And so the Holy Spirit was convicting me, not really just because I was reading the Bible, just over my sin and, and over everything. I mean, it was absolutely, I was seeing who I was. I was going to Bible studies at this time, doing much religious activity. I was looking at myself before God as a murderer as a pervert, as somebody who hated him. I, I looked at, I, if I remember correctly, I don't want to dishonor God and get this wrong here, but I would see things in the Bible about narrow is the road, few are on it, and all these things you should love God. And I began to like, my pride was coming down, like maybe I'm not saved, right? And I was under such a spiritual delusion from growing up in lukewarm Christianity. The only thing anathema in lukewarm Christianity. The only thing devoted to destruction in lukewarm Christianity is how dare you question anyone is saved who claims Christ. And that is absolutely anti-biblical. So I was under such a spiritual drunkenness. The last thing I thought as I was going through all this was that I wasn't saved. I just thought I needed to get closer to God, get more sanctified. And it was very sad. I went through this for months and months and months. Another verse that was very important and I experienced this verse and I knew as I was going through it that I was experiencing it because I both read it and experienced it at the same time during the six to nine month period. Jesus spoke about legalistically, religiously trying to save yourself and clean yourself up. Jesus said, when the unclean spirit goes out of a man, it passes through waterless places seeking rest and not finding any. It says, I will return to my house from which I came. The house is the body of a man. And when it comes, it finds it swept and put in order. Then it goes and takes along seven other spirits more evil than itself, and they go in and live there. And the last state of that man becomes worse than the first. You see, this is what happens when you try and clean yourself up. I was running. I actually ran a 50-mile ultra marathon before I was saved. I cleaned up what I ate. I lost 40 pounds. I was looking good. I was feeling clean. I was brushing my teeth five times a day, but I was dead and rotten inside. And this is how it would work. This is how false religion works. False religion does work. That's what makes it dangerous. Paul talks about you know, the, the food you eat and be like, like the, the way you treat your body, it can be related to false religion. It doesn't mean you shouldn't eat good food and take care of your body. Absolutely. But when you do it to save yourself, this is what happens. You actually feel cleaner. Weeks would go by and I wouldn't struggle with pornography and I would, I would feel saved and I would feel like everything's going to be okay in life. But then all of a sudden something would come out of nowhere and my temptations were grosser than I could ever imagine. They were grosser than they had to begin with and I needed to fulfill those lusts and I would fall back into sin, like a, like a pig going back to the mud, like a dog going back to his vomit. Literally, there were times during this six to nine month period, they sc still scare me to this day. It was like, it was like, literally, I would be walking along and all of a sudden a temptation would come and I would be like, Lord, where is that coming from? What on earth is wrong with me? And it's because I was dead in my sins. I swept my house clean, but it was empty. The Holy Spirit had not inhabited it. And so I was ripe for the picking without even knowing it. While I was reading the Bible, I was getting into all manner of false religions, Buddhism, chakra meditations, all manner of different things. And although I was sinfully responsible for this behavior, I also didn't know my right hand from my left. It was terrible. And so just a month or so, maybe a month or two before I got saved, in my legalistic zeal, I literally flew to Israel, went to the Jordan River, and got baptized where Jesus was. 
And I always say, if baptism could save you, I would have been saved before I got saved. Because, I mean, what's a better baptism than where, where you know, we estimate Jesus was bad. That's the best baptism, right? And I came up out of the water and nothing. And if I remember correctly, I fell into watching pornography that night in Israel. I came home absolutely miserable, broken, realizing I had no way to stop sinning. I didn't want to stop sinning, but I also didn't want to go to hell. I didn't, I just really wanted to want to stop sinning, but I just didn't to my core. And then finally, I began to focus on the real issue. I did not believe Jesus was God. I read the Bible. I read books about the Bible. I'm Jewish by uh, blood. And I believe I had a veil there. I read every prophecy about Jesus in the Old Testament. That is why that's a massive part of my ministry today. And I did not believe Jesus was God. Some days I felt like Jesus was God and I felt good. Other days I felt like he was an imposter and I felt anxiety. And it, it, it really, I mean, it was all my anxiety about money and pornography and all these things. They shifted to, is Jesus really God? I couldn't understand that. You cannot understand that. In the flesh, only the Spirit of God can make you know beyond a shadow of a doubt that Jesus is God. And so 2 Samuel 22 and Psalm 120 both have this similar statement. This is what happened. One night I was having anxiety. I couldn't believe Jesus was God. I had torn apart the Bible. I had read it. And in my distress, I called upon the Lord. I cried out to my God, and from his temple he heard my voice, and my cry for help reached his ears. I looked up to God one night, and I said, God, I can't figure this out. I, I, I don't understand this. Can you just give it to me? And he did. By the grace of God, he did. He saved me. I felt a weight come off my shoulders immediately. I went home joyful and happy. I had no idea I'd just gotten saved. I thought I was saved my whole life. I went back to work the next day and I opened up my Bible. I read this verse, Romans chapter 4, verse 5, one of the most important verses in my life. The one who does not work, but believes in him, Jesus, who justifies the ungodly. You see, when I went into work that day, something strange happened. Without reading the Bible, I was 100% certain Jesus was God. The God that was in the tabernacle, the God that was in the temple, the God that sat enthroned at the flood, the angel of the Lord, the, the God of the Old Testament, Yahweh, I knew Jesus was the creator, fully man and fully God. Then I read with the Holy Spirit that he died to justify ungodly men. And the Spirit had taught me for months just how ungodly and wicked I was. And I read that his faith is credited as righteousness. I knew I believed in Jesus. And I knew he died to justify the ungodly. And I knew I was ungodly. And so I knew I was saved in that moment. It was radical. And here's where the purification came. This was my very next thought after reading that. I didn't read these verses, but looking back, this is exactly what happened. It was as if all my lust was like a, a glowing piece of hot metal coming out of a kiln, coming out of a fire, and you put it in the water and just smoke everywhere. There was a rapid cooling effect in my life. I was set free from the law. Let me explain this. John writes in 1 John chapter 3, Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not appeared as yet what we will be. We know that when he appears, we will be like him, because we will see him just as he is. Beloved, the, the moment I got saved, I knew I was going to see Jesus one day when I died. And it says everyone who has this hope fixed on him purifies himself just as he is pure. So here's the secret to, to, to freeing yourself from these when you're saved. I knew I would see Jesus. And literally, this was my thought. I want you to understand, grace is not a license to sin. Grace gives you the power to overcome your sin. However, in that moment, I knew I could go home and watch pornography. I knew I could. And that when I died, Jesus was going to hug me. He was going to hold me and he was going to tell me he forgave me. But something miraculous happened. I knew I could do that. I knew I was forgiven. I knew Jesus died for me. And I never wanted to do that again. And it's been years now, and I've never fallen into that sin again. I've never had a serious temptation to that sin again. I'm not saying I've never had a lustful thought. I've just never really had a temptation to do that again. I knew I was forgiven. I knew I could do it. I couldn't stop watching pornography to save myself. I was already saved. But because of that, I didn't want to offend this great God who died for me to save me. So 
The moment I got saved, there was instant justification. I was born again, but yes, there was an instant sanctification. And it was a very powerful sanctification. I knew I was free from the law and I had no desire to sin. I wanted to serve God. I immediately began stumbling around evangelism, trying to tell people about Jesus. It was awesome. And so you've heard of an overview of how I got saved. You heard of my pre-salvation and, and salvation experience, but then there's a post-salvation experience, sanctification. There's some extremely important verses, and there is an experience that I went through of a temptation, and I think it's really important that you guys hear this. So I, I put it together. I want to share it with you. And then I also have some practical tips, just some ongoing tips for sanctification. But right after I got saved, I came across these verses, and I think they're so important. Second Peter chapter 1 says, God's divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness. So it comes from God. It's a gift. However, the means God has used is through the true knowledge of him, Jesus, who called us by his own glory and excellent. And this next verse really opened up my eyes and I believed helped me dig into the Bible more. Check this out. It says, for by these, okay, by these promises, by this knowledge, he has granted to us his, th these are the words that I think really helped me in the beginning. By, by these, by his true knowledge, his glory, his excellence, he has granted to us his precious and magnificent promises, plural, so that by them, by these promises, you may per become partakers of the divine nature. We literally partake of the Holy Spirit. It is in us, having escaped the corruption that is in the world by lust. So, so do you get that, beloved? By God's promises, you escape the corruption that's in the world by lust. Now, there's a direct interpretation of these. We're talking about the eternal covenant promises of salvation sealed in the blood of Christ. However, I think there's a wide application of this verse. You need to understand, God has given many, many, many promises in Scripture, and you need to be greedy and have a desire to learn them all because they all are joyful and they're a great experience and they're how you grow in the knowledge of God's glory and excellence. So at first, yes, you need to understand the promises of the gospel of Jesus Christ, that he died for his bride, that his righteousness is credited to you by faith, all of that. Then go deeper, go into the doctrines of grace, learn about the election and predestination, how God wrote your name in the book of life before the foundation of the world. But don't stop there. And you don't have to do all these at one time. If you're a desirous and lustful man or woman, when you get saved, you've still probably got a lot of energy. You can read the Bible for hours every day, right? Go deeper than that, or not deeper than that. Go wider than that. Learn about the promises of the kingdom. Read Revelation 21 and 22. Learn about the river of life and the fruit of life and the every diamond and gold stone that will be in heaven and realize your father and the son, Jesus Christ, who died for you, is building a place for you and learn about that kingdom. Learn about the priesthood of Christ. Learn about the kingly office of Christ. Learn Bible prophets. Learn it all. Learn all the magnificent promises. Obviously, start with the milk and then go to the meat, but don't cut yourself short Anything God has revealed in his word, chase it down every rabbit hole. And, and it's incredible. It's such a joyful, exuberant experience. My friends, I'm telling you the truth. It makes pornography look boring. It makes your old sins look boring but compared to having a relationship with God and constantly learning new things about him. By these magnificent promises, we escape the corruption that is in the world by lust. Now, one more warning, and I went through this experience, I, th I think about twice. It was very dark. But what happened is as months went by of being saved, uh, the first six months, a year of being saved was awesome. I was sitting at that picnic table. I was reading the Bible all day. The Spirit of God, we were enjoying fellowship. But then I started to have anxiety about falling back into sin. I was so scared. Even to this day, I'll have dreams uh, that I'm cheating or watching pornography. I'll have these horrible dreams that I've fallen into sin. But at this time, I was having horrible anxiety like, oh, Lord, I love my time with you, but I know I'm going to fall back. I know I'm going to turn away. Like what? You know, and I was just having all this anxiety. So this anxiety came. 
And by the grace of God, he led me through a temptation. In fact, twice, one time while I was at home and one time while I was away with the military and both times, one was early at morning and one was late at night. Uh, they, they were triggered by something I don't really remember, but it was as if for just an hour or two, it was as if the spirit let, uh, like left me. And I know God never leaves me, but this is what happened. I, I had all this anxiety. I was you know, trying to fight sin in the flesh again. And I had all this anxiety. I, I had no desire to fall back into this sin, just so you know. I just had anxiety about falling back into it. And a temptation came and, and there were lustful thoughts. And I literally cried out to God. But for like two hours, it was as if all the ungodly, unholy temptations came back. It was as if I wasn't saved. And I just remember crying crying to God. And literally just this short period, it was as if God removed his restraining hand and I was just going to plunge headlong into sin. And both times he was totally fatherly. He was totally gracious. He He restored it. Everything was perfectly fine. I did not fall into sin. But through those experiences very early on, I learned the meaning of these two verses, Paul in Romans 7, I know that nothing good dwells in me. That is in my flesh. For the willing is present in me, but the doing of good is is not. He writes again in the Philippians, We are the true circumcision. Our heart has been circumcised. The filth has been cut away. We worship in the Spirit of God. We glory in Christ Jesus. And very important, we put no confidence in the flesh. So this deepened my walk as I learned that literally, if it is not for the supernatural grace, it's not like you get saved and God leaves you on your own. If it is not God holding me and supernaturally, powerfully working within me every day, I would fall headlong into abominations. Judas sold Jesus for 30 shekels of silver. Apart from the grace of God, for one moment, I'd do it for 29. And I knew in that, like after these temptations and and by God's grace, he kept me through them. I knew we just have to cast ourselves upon Christ every day. No confidence in the flesh. And, and that's, you know, something I deal with every day. We want to do that. I'm not saying I never have a lustful thought, but by the grace of God, he's just purified me of this. He's healed me of this disease, of this affliction, of this sin. And so I'm so thankful for God saving me. I'm so honored that I get to speak to any believer or non-believer that struggles with this. It is an honor. I've never met a worse pornography addict than me, at least not somebody willing to admit it. And by the grace of God, he saved me. He can save you. He sanctified me. He can sanctify you. He's a great God. He's a great savior. Therefore, to be a great savior, you need great sinners to save, right? If you're going to demonstrate your forgiveness and your grace, you need really bad sinners. And that's who I was. And, and, and Jesus welcomes all to come to him. I just want to end with some just common sense tips for believers uh, who struggle with this sin. Number one, prayer and personal Bible reading. Your time alone with God one-on-one is paramount. Then fellowship and accountability. Find people that you can confess this to and speak with them about it and let them hold you accountable. And finally, ministry, service, whatever that is, serving in church, evangelism, witnessing, whatever it is. I always say God doesn't need me for ministry. Um, But Romans, you know, I need God for ministry and I'm so thankful for that. But Romans chapter six says that we've been freed from sin and enslaved to God. There's no more true freedom than being enslaved to a righteous, holy and good God. And it says now you derive your benefit resulting in sanctification. So by being enslaved to God, presenting your members to him to work, we have a benefit. It results in sanctification and the end eternal life. And this is what I've learned over time. Desire is a blessing from God when sanctified. I've even had a a brother in Christ tell me, I think you have the gift of desire. There's great passions that I have that have now been sanctified. And those can get you in a lot of trouble. We need to be careful with those. We don't want to follow our feelings or emotions. All I'm saying is before I was saved, I had a vast amount of passion and energy and drive. And so I became a great, great, great sinner. I poured it into whatever felt good. Now I, I still have uh, righteous, holy affections. I, I don't, you know, I, God is, I, I desire to read the Bible. I desire to pray. I, I want to tell people about Jesus. And so as, as I, we always have to keep prayer and personal Bible reading first and, and keep our priorities straight. However, when we do that, ministry has a sanctifying effect, a working for God. We want to keep ourselves busy. Idle hands are the devil's playthings. 
I love you guys. I hope this encouraged you. Uh, feel free to email me if you have any questions. Foolishministries at gmail.com.